Welcome to AI Exposed. I'm your host, Justin Scott. This is a podcast dedicated to exploring all the technologies that premier support for developer teams at Microsoft use when helping companies just like yours looking to take advantage of artificial intelligence. In this episode, number four, I had the opportunity to sit with one of Microsoft's data scientists, Ernst Henley, and discuss a machine learning project that Ernst has been working on for a few months for one of our hospital customers. The customer is looking for a way to reduce the occurrence of a particular disease within their facility. Enjoy the show. Hi, Ernst. Welcome to the show. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. Uh, One of the things I like to start with is to understand a little bit of background before we jump into uh, some of your project that we're going to talk about. So, you know, introduce yourself, tell us what you do at Microsoft, and uh, maybe a little background. Okay, well, uh, originally I was a biophysicist. Uh, I got my PhD in Berkeley, and I studied aging and how free radicals attack DNA. So I left academia and went to Silicon Valley where I became a developer and worked on algorithms for drug discovery and bioinformatics, which brought me up to Seattle to uh, Merck, which is a large pharmaceutical company, and in their software division. Um, I was there for some time and Microsoft acquired that software division, so that's how I came to Microsoft. And that initially that was in the health solutions group. And since then, I've been using predictive analytics uh, for a variety of situations, but mainly in healthcare. Okay. So we talked a little bit about uh, a recent project that you did, and uh, we thought we would deep dive that into that a little bit for this show. So maybe give us a little bit of an overview of the project. Okay. Uh, well, it's to predict if a patient is going to contract a disease called C. diff. C. diff is short for Clostridium difficile, that's the name of the bacterium, that causes this intestinal infection. And uh, it's a big problem in hospitals worldwide, and even in the USA, there are about 30,000 deaths a year, I believe. And this is a hospital-acquired disease. That means people come in with some other problem, but they contract this disease in the hospital. And uh, it, and it's a severe disease. Even for those that survive it, they uh, have uh, severe symptoms. Okay. And if you solve this problem, how does it help the hospital? I mean, obviously it helps okay. the patients out, but what is it that they're trying to achieve? Well, that's actually a good question. The hospitals have an First of all, obviously, the hospitals, as as advocates for their patients, have the interest, as you pointed out, to uh, do what is best and to help the patient so they don't get the disease. The hospitals themselves, though, uh, are penalized for uh, these kinds of uh, problems. That means if they have high C. diff rates, then uh, they... uh, that becomes known and they get and they can even get some kinds of fines uh, levied against them. So uh, there are uh, big financial incentives for the hospitals to avoid these diseases uh, like C. diff. Okay. And, th- and there's actually some other components from a marketing perspective too, right? Aren't there statistics that hospitals keep as well? Yes, that is correct. And that's what I meant to say. There is also the, what, People might refer to as a brand name or uh, a branding of a hospital. Hospitals are known if they have uh, these, uh, what rates of infections they have, of what rates of hospital-acquired infections they have, and that uh, does make a difference for a lot of patients. So patients, if they have the choice, will obviously avoid the hospitals that have these higher rates of infections, which is often sometimes a little bit unfair to the hospitals since the hospitals that have sometimes these highest rates have them because uh, they are the most qualified hospitals to deal with the sickest patients. And it's often these sickest patients who come down with these uh, hospital-acquired diseases. Oh, wow. That's an interesting paradox. Um, So you have a team that was approached by a customer of ours, and they asked for help solving this uh, problem. So let's just deep dive a little bit into the dynamics of solving this with a team. 
Uh, maybe you can go into a little bit about what your team composed of, what kind of roles uh, were on your team. Well, there is obviously the data science role. So I'm the data scientist, but I also have a variety of other data scientists here in Redmond that I can work with. Uh, and they will give me advice when I ask for it, and I present every now and then, and I get uh, feedback from them. Uh, beyond that, I we also have uh, other experts in, at Microsoft, and those are, well, we have the engagement managers that coordinate everything, make everything run smoothly, uh, remove the obstacles, the bureaucratic and other obstacles, and there are a lot when you're working in a hospital setting. And then there are also the BI experts, and these are very important people because uh, if I create the best model, that won't do anyone any good unless I can get the outputs of that model, the information, to the customer at the right time. So it needs to get to the right person at the right time. And uh, that is something that a BI developer can do. Okay. And how did you start getting your information from this project? Who did you interact with or what tools did you use just to really understand what they're asking? Okay, I guess I need to be a little bit more clear. So the information that I, uh, well, I talked to a lot of the subject matter experts. In this particular case, the subject matter experts are the experts at the hospital where I'm working. So I go on site there and I talk to these. These experts are mainly physicians, uh, some nurses, some hospital administrators, and some infectious disease specialists. So it is, I discuss the kinds of data that they think will help uh, solve the problem, that they think will help uh, provide the best inputs to a model in predictive analytics. Okay, that and so sense. that's where I start, and I, I have to then educate myself a lot on the disease because there are a lot of little quirks. There are, for instance, there I want to be able to predict hospital-acquired uh, C. diff, and uh, I need I, I don't want to actually predict uh, C. diff that uh, is community-acquired. The reason for the difference is because I, I want to be able to provide information to the physicians so that they can reduce the infections that occur in the hospital. But often, a patient might come in that already has C. diff, and that uh, data goes into my model, and I need to be able to distinguish that from uh, the hospital-acquired C. diff. Okay. So I can only figure out these nuances if I have the information from the experts to begin with that there are such differences exist and what I can look for. Okay. And I'm trying to get a real feel for the actual inner workings of how you got your information. Mm -hmm. I don't always hear about data scientists mm -hmm. that get to interact directly with the customer. So that's a really neat yes. uh, atmosphere that you had. Were there a team of you that came on site or did you get that one-on-one -on -one yes. contact? There was a team uh, that of people from Microsoft who went on site to the hospital. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the only way that uh, something as complex as this project can work. I needed that one-on-one -on -one in person contact. And when I say one-on-one, -on -one, it's obviously, you know, with many people. So it's uh, the whole Microsoft team talking to the people at the the on location with the physicians and infectious disease specialists and uh, the uh, database experts that work at the hospital. So unless I have that strong connection, I'm sure that I will be missing uh, key information and uh, and I will be missing a lot of the uh, what makes a project go well. So I will be missing the uh, 
I will not uh, find out that there are other experts that I can talk to, even some IT experts that I will need to uh, talk to, or that now I would say I need to talk to them, but I did not even know of their existence before I actually got there on site. So that's the kind of information that, in my experience, I don't get when I'm not on site. And although Skype meetings are great, they are still not good enough. Right. And, and to take it a step further, uh, there's lots of teams that will send somebody on site that will write up a document and try to be a translator. And so much gets lost in that is where I think you're hitting on. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I can understand that oh, a lot of people want to do this and they want to do it for the obvious reason that it can be a lot cheaper. The travel expenses are substantial and it also takes a lot of time uh, from people that well because again the travel takes additional time takes a, a large overhead on time so I can understand that you want to reduce that expenditure but it does come at a cost because if I find out about some new way of dealing with a problem, if there is some new IT expert, or not new to me, that IT expert may have been there, and in, in, in the case I'm thinking of, was there all the time, and that IT expert, I, uh, uh, I find out about her uh, much later, then uh, I going to probably ask, well, can I restart certain aspects of the project? That'll delay the project. It'll incur more costs. And at the end, uh, I would have probably paid or the cost, the project would have cost uh, more than uh, if than it actually did because I actually went on site, traveled, found out about this ex these uh, other people that can help me because I socialized right so there this social component is usually underestimated by uh, data scientists um, surprisingly or not surprisingly it's actually pretty clear it's not underestimated by uh, project managers I understand I understand okay so you got to have a meeting of the minds you went on site and you learned a ton uh, how did it go for the next step where you actually started knowing what data to get, uh, and then that process of actually getting that data from the hospital so that you could start your project. Okay, well, the knowing what data to get was one par part, as you point out, and uh, that had to do with talking a lot with the medical experts. The second part that you're asking me about now is the uh, talking to the IT experts. These are uh, database engineers and uh, database developers that are associated with the hospital. Some of this is pretty tricky. These are obviously uh, well-qualified people, but I have to go through them. So it's not an option. It's not something that they are helping me. It is something that is required. And the reason it's required is that I'm actually not allowed to touch any of their computers or uh, they're, I'm not allowed to go onto their database. They can pull data for me, and I can uh, describe how I want the data pulled. And usually I don't get it quite the way I, I require. Often it's not possible, and often the, there's... Um, when you know two even two developers are talking to each other, there's a little bit that gets lost in, in the, that... In the, conversation because we don't talk in code we talk using normal language and so often we don't I don't communicate exactly what I want but the point is is that these developers then have to take what I say turn it into their code and pull the data sometimes I can show them code that I would write but often it doesn't work in that particular situation they know the database and I'm not allowed to actually see the database. I'm not allowed to touch their computers. And they pull the data for me. And then that goes then to a, uh, essentially a staging area. And I'm allowed to work in that staging area. And the reason for all of this is because these data have to be protected. These are um, patient data. And so they are protected by law. 
And besides that, everyone, you know, understands it. You know, we want to protect uh, uh, a, the privacy of people in general, but patients in particular. Right. That is a interesting part of this project is the uh, the patient information, which uh, we know through certain laws like HIPAA is such a big deal to uh, protect the data. Uh, okay, so you worked with on-site folks that are part of that hospital organization to get you the data that you needed. Was there a pipeline set up so that you could continuously get new data or was it one of those things that you could get a one-time dump of data and do all that you needed to do for this stage of the project? I have a one-time dump of data. Fortunately, these are talented developers that understand uh, the concept of reusability and that also are uh, savvy that and they know that uh, I'm going to come back and you know two days later and say, well, you know what I asked you for before, you did well, you got me that stuff. But it turns out I really didn't know what I was asking for and I want something slightly different. And so they have to go back and uh, pull the data again in a slightly different manner. So to that end, they have all their scripts lined up and ready to go. In the long run, actually, we want to do what you implied, and that is create a pipeline. This pipeline is where, and it should be automatic, that makes a huge data pull of uh, tremendous amounts of data takes that data and then goes through a lot of automatic data preparation, processing, even model generation, and then model selection, and then eventually uh, uh, deposits and deploys the model where it does the most amount, where, it, where it's being used. Right. Now, do you have a team that can help you groom that data, or is this part of your job as well? Okay. It is largely my job. I can get the uh, I do have people that can help me here in Redmond and on in the hospital site, which is out of state, uh, there these database developers can also help me. The problem is is that I need to be very specific in how I want this work to be done. Often it takes more time for me to delegate that work than for me to do it myself even though a lot of this work is quite mundane and is grunt work. Uh, data science is um, a relatively new field because we have these new tools where we can get so much more information out of data, and so that's wonderful. But we still haven't solved some of the basic problems, and that is data in data preparation. So... People generally say that a uh, the data preparation is about two thirds of the work, and in my experience, it's actually about eighty five percent of the work. Right. And so, data preparation I consider to be uh, everything that stands between the data that is used for the final model and the uh, data as it uh, exists in its native state in the database. Okay. And yep. Uh, so another question I have, keep going on this data side, is now that we have data in the system and you're talking about prepping it, do you recall some of the challenges that you had specifically with this data? Can you give us some examples of what you were just referring oh. to? Yes, I can. Well, uh, I mean, some of the data, we have the obvious problem of the data being um, somewhat dirty. Everyone can understand that. Um, I have some thing that most everyone can relate to. We, uh, in the medical community, as in most scientific communities, you use Celsius, but we live in a society where a lot of people still use Fahrenheit. So I have patient temperatures recorded in both Celsius and Fahrenheit. In that same column of data, patient temperature, admit temperature, I also have some kind of what initially I thought were crazy outliers. I had, so temperature typically 37 degrees Celsius, so 37, that's your normal temperature. And then I had um, a temperature of um, 9,700 degrees. 
Obviously, that couldn't be right. right. Well, it was Fahrenheit, and the decimal point was missing. Ah, I see. So then I looked, and I found, well, I also have uh, temperatures of 365 degrees. That was a Celsius where a decimal, decimal point was missing. Mm. So now I have four different types of temperatures, actually more, because sometimes uh, the, it was 365, sometimes it was 3,000. 650 degrees, sometimes it was 37 degrees, sometimes it was 98.6, and those are all roughly the same temperature, very different numbers. The computer obviously cannot understand that these are different numbers. The machine is going to interpret these as if they are very different, and probably I would they are considered to be outliers. I would have to throw all this out, except if I write a little routine that can clean this up. This is a very common problem in not just in, in, in uh, the medical community or in these types of databases. These types of data entry problems are very common. Okay. Then I also have occasional ages of 999 years old. And that's a, also a common problem. These are people uh, that when they don't enter in an age, instead of entering in a proper null value because they don't know that they can enter in a null value or possibly the database will not allow them to enter in a null value. So they uh, put in an age of 999 to indicate that basically they did not know the person's age. Mm. So that's, again, a problem because the model does not understand this shorthand for uh, or this uh, like shorthand is a poor phrase, this uh, alternate to a null, and the model is actually going to consider this age of 999 unless it gets rejected as an outlier. And if it gets rejected as an outlier, then I have, I'm uh, possibly missing a whole record because of somebody's data entry of that nature. I see. When you look at these records, are you looking for sort of a Pareto effect of, um, I have a bulk of these records, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe 500 records out of, I'm just going to make up a number, 200,000 that are showing me a temperature range that makes no sense. And then you write an algorithm for that. Or do you have to get down to this record? They really meant this. I mean, are you getting to the record level or is it always based on bulks of trends? Okay, well, it should be based on bulks of trends, and I certainly start out there. Right. The nature of a data scientist is that, uh, similar to a lot of other engineers, we are very detail-oriented. So often I get pulled into the weeds, and that's where I actually do some of my best work. The flip side of that is, is that sometimes I try to fix too many of these data aberrations, and I go record by record. Obviously, I can't do that. There's a limit to that, given that I have about 500,000 patient cases that I need to deal with. So uh, that doesn't quite work out. And I have roughly uh, 1,000 attributes for each patient that I wish to consider. Wow. So yes, I would like to jealously guard every bit of data that I have and make uh, sure that it doesn't get lost and that it can be used. But obviously that's not realistic and I need to uh, prioritize and often say, okay, uh, I can not use an attribute because there's just uh, too big of a data problem, too much missing data, uh, too much incorrectly entered data, and I have to eliminate it. And I also have to write routines that will do that automatically. Again, I'm, I have roughly a, uh, a thousand attributes that I consider, and I started off with many, many more than a thousand. So I, in order to whittle that down to just a thousand attributes, reasonable attributes, I needed to write some routines that would eliminate data just because the data were uh, too dirty uh, or uh, had too many missing values. Okay, and you don't really 
eliminate rows at this step, right? If there's, say, a Fahrenheit or, or Celsius, say that there was a, I'm just going to make up, there's a letter in there. I mean, it's obviously mm -hmm. nothing you can translate it to. Uh, that would invalidate that data point or that attribute mm -hmm. for that for a particular model. But you would, I would assume you would keep the rest of the row because there could be other valuable information in there. You're absolutely right. That's how it is done. Obviously, there are some times when you just have to give up on a row of data because there are some some parts of the data that are missing are too important, and then you have to give up on that row of data. Uh, in other cases, or and the preferred way of doing this kind of work, because we always have missing data, I probably don't have a single record uh, of those 500,000 where I'm sure that I do not have a single record of those 500,000 where I don't have some missing data. Okay. So I need to uh, impute. So that means do a best guess. There are a variety of ways that I can impute these values. And uh, one of the most trivial ways is I can just say, okay, what's the median value uh, for these cases? Then I can be a little bit more sophisticated. I can do some segmentation of the patient population. So I use a technique called clustering. And then... I can impute only the mean for that cluster that is that patient is matched to. Okay. Then I can use other techniques. There is a, a standard technique called MICE that is for multiple imputations. Uh, so basically, I can create a little predictive analytics program that takes all the other data except for uh, that attribute that is missing and I try to predict that missing attribute mm -hmm. so it's sort of like you can think of this as a bootstrapping uh, generally people will call this then semi-supervised oh. because I am actually doing I am uh, imputing data that will then be later used that is intrinsic to okay I'm imputing data based on an intrinsic part of my uh, data set specifically my training data set I understand. Uh, so when you're looking through this data uh, and you uh, you may take an average of something to fill it in so that it doesn't skew your model. Is that is that what I'm hearing? That is correct. That is the simplest way of doing data imputation. And sometimes that works. As I said, the more sophisticated ways go a step further where I don't just take the average of that right. value throughout the whole hospital population, but only take the average from uh, a subset of the population, or I can be even more sophisticated, and instead of taking an average, I can actually do um, a kind of a regression uh, that uh, that is, so it's its own little sub-predictive analytics model that is only there to fill in the missing attribute for one attribute. I the see. missing values for one attribute. I see. Uh, what tool is your tool, and there may be many, uh, that helps you get through this process? Okay, the tools by ranking. Some of the most important tool is Azure Machine Learning because I need to do, I need to, at the end, I have to present the model in Azure Machine Learning. And Azure Machine Learning is, works very well together with the rest of Microsoft's BI stack. So as much as I can do in Azure Machine Learning, I will do, and I do quite a bit of exploratory data analysis in Azure Machine Learning. I do some of this data imputation. I do some model selection. Often there are things that I want to do that where Azure Machine Learning doesn't have the uh, technology yet. Uh, a lot of this is being developed as we speak, but some of it just isn't there and in that in those cases i usually use r the reason i use r is because r integrates so nicely into uh, azure machine learning as does python by the way but r also has the ability that i can even write r and put that into uh, sql or into a sql server so that um, in the when sql commands are run that the R can be embedded into those uh, statements and 
I can do some of my data processing in that manner. That uh, is advantageous to for creating that final pipeline that I spoke about earlier. And so I like to do my work in R. Uh, besides that, I use, uh, obviously I use um, SQL and uh, the uh, SSMS. Those are very important tools for me. And I guess one of the little secrets in um, all of BI and all of data science is, is that everyone uses Excel. I was going to ask that. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, Excel hasn't gone away. Excel will not go away. I Excel has a doesn't have the necessarily the most sophisticated tools, but it is such a, a direct way of looking at data. Uh, so I feel that I'm actually touching the data when I'm using Excel, um, and a lot of people don't like admitting it to it because Excel does have its limitations and and it sort of uh, and it's more associated with the with the novice BI um, developer or not even developer. But the truth is all of us use Excel and uh, it helps us a lot. Yeah, I would definitely agree. All right, so we've explored getting the data and I know we spent a lot of time on that because that is such a big part of the project. So it interests me a lot and probably our viewers or, or listeners. Uh, now that we have data and you're ready to start exploring some models, walk us through that process. So the data have been rectangularized and they're all ready to go. The next step is what is called feature selection or model selection. Maybe one step before that is choosing which algorithms I want to use. And that choice of algorithms is uh, can sometimes be confusing and difficult. I would like to use the most predictive algorithms, but sometimes these most predictive algorithms uh, act like black boxes. What I need for the model to be effective is not just tell the physician that I believe a patient Ha, is going to come down with C. diff in a few days. But I also need to tell the physician why I believe that. Mm. Because only if I can tell the physician why I believe that can this predictive component be turned easily into a prescriptive component. So that's the difference between predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics. Sometimes it's almost the same. So you can get from predictive analytics to prescriptive analytics very easily if you use algorithms where the uh, coefficients or the, the individual components that create the prediction are easily understood. And the two algorithms which do this are some of the oldest and algorithms which are the, that have been used the most and are not the coolest algorithms, and those are logistic regression and naive Bayes. Mm. Those will those two algorithms will give me this information in the most convenient and easy way. There are some new attempts to use uh, generalized additive models, and those are very interesting. Uh, to use those, I need to write that into R or Java and wrap that uh, so that. I can use that in Azure Machine Learning. And so right now I'm not going down that route, although uh, I may decide to do that. So now I'm doing a, an approach where I am providing the physician with multiple uh, predictions, one each based on a model. Some of these models are highly predictive, and some of these models have uh, what I call influencers associated with them. So all of this I'm telling you is to describe what algorithms I choose. So I generally choose to start off with a naive Bayesian logistic regression just because, well, they can they do the job almost always even um, if 
uh, the data aren't quite right and if things don't work out so well, the prediction, the, the, the um, accuracy measures aren't necessarily the best, but I get a working model relatively easily. So that's how I start off. And I get these influencers that I just talked about. Then I like to go to another workhorse model, which is called a uh, decision forest. So decision forest is Microsoft's name for what uh, Bremen and Cutler called a random forest. But random forest, I guess, is trademarked. So we need to call it as decision forest. And that is um, another workhorse. But this one is generally more powerful. It can uh, use interactions. It can model interactions uh, between the various attributes in uh, a much deeper way than those other two that I named mm, okay. and still doesn't t- tend to overfit the data. Then what I obviously like to go to is, are, well, not, it's not obvious necessarily, but I do like to go to neural nets. At present, we have uh, the neural nets uh, in uh, AML uh, are workable, but they require actually some extra sub-programming within um AML and those those models can be the most predictive, can be the most powerful. Their problem is is that those are absolute black boxes, as by the way the random the decision forest is too. Or so I cannot get influencers out of them, at least not easily. There is a brute force method how so I can get influencers out of those, but that's very difficult uh, computationally expensive and um, the other problem with the neural nets is is that uh, although this disease that I'm dealing with right now C. diff is relatively prevalent that means a half a percent of all patients all encounters not just all patients but if you go into the hospital you have straight off bat a half a percent chance of getting this disease so although that's a large number if you multiply that by the 500,000 patients that I've had then you know we're only talking about a little bit more than 2,000 cases mm. of C. diff over the period that I'm looking at, the seven-year period that I'm looking at. Two, so that with 2,000 cases, my training is going to be only on possibly 1,500 of those cases. And 1,500 now becomes a pretty small number when I'm using a sophisticated neural net. That especially if I have, uh, if I start off with a thousand attributes. The problem here is a uh, something called overfitting. So a neural net will, can find random patterns in the training data to explain the outcome. Now, almost any algorithm can do this, but the neural nets are best at this. They can find patterns wherever they are. And if you have enough inputs, then you each input comes along with some noise. And that noise, although might be random in principle, since it's a finite set of numbers, is not random. And therefore, we'll have a pattern. That pattern can be exploited, even though that pattern won't Cannot, won't show itself again ever again. It's only sub. It's only within that one training set. Right. That pattern will be exploited by the algorithm, and the algorithm will say it has done a great job in figuring out uh, how to get from the inputs to predict if someone is going to get C diff, and. The algorithm will be absolutely right, but only in the context of the training data, not even the test data, and certainly not when the model is to be operationalized. Right. It explains so that set only. This It only explains that set, and then I can't use this model, which means that these more sophisticated algorithms, or especially the neural nets, they typically require larger amounts of data. So... Those, that's the spectrum that I have to work with. I want to get to the neural net, but often I have to say, no, I can't. Um, then I will use a random forest, which is 
also quite good. There I have, uh, the, let me repeat that, the decision forest. I would like to use the decision forest, but uh, even there I have the problem that I cannot get influencers out of the decision forest, at least not easily. And then I have the um, naive bays and logistic regression where I can get uh, influencers, but they, those algorithms tend to be somewhat less uh, predictive. How do we get the influ oh, back up? How do we <clears throat> explain how influencers are not good? <laughs> well, influencers are good. Influencers are what I want to present to the uh, to the physician. An influencer is a um, attribute that uh, is a that uh, is. It's when you're predictive for a specific patient and for a specific prediction. Okay. So if a patient X will have her set of influencers and patient Y will have his set of influencers, often they will be the same influencers. In the case of C. diff, the typical influencer will be prior use of antibiotics, uh, recent uh abdominal surgery or and maybe use of um, of uh, gastric acid suppressors so those would be the typical influencers but for any specific person there might be some variation also I can put a number next to those influencers and say that uh, well for this person it was actually not uh, the the major reason for the prediction is is the age, and the fact that this person came from a nursing facility. I so although those are not the the most the strongest predictors in general for the model for a specific patient. They may they might be the most important predictors. Okay, you you had mentioned. Uh, taking them out, and so I, I misunderstood. I thought you were saying they were negative, and I was trying to understand that. So now I, we're all on the same page mm -hmm. now. Uh, so I want to understand the sort of the tail end of the project. You've worked through all these models. Uh, they probably have varying degrees of predictability and success for how it can predict future patients uh, getting this disease. How do you then take that information, which you have tons of, and translate that to something digestible for the customer? The well, there is. We have a another team that is working on a data visualization in Power BI, and that means that I need to work with this data visualization team and explain to them what my outputs will look like. My outputs will be some predictions. So, for any given patient, they might be um, one or more numbers all between zero and one, one mean uh, or being 100%, zero being 0% 0 likelihood that a person will come down with C. diff. And I will give this BI developer also a list of influencers that I believe uh, contribute to this prediction. The database developer, or the, not the database developer, the BI developer's job is now to present this to the physician and must present it to the physician at the right time. That means the this BI developer has to create a web page that is easily accessible by any of the hospital staff, basically at any point in time. That BI developer needs to understand and has to work together with the data engineers at the location so that that information of the patient gets guided and funneled to the BI developer's uh, work where and uh, job where my uh, model intersects with the hospital's data and with the uh, visualization. And then the, that BI developer's job is then to present that uh, in a in a in a nice way to present that data to the physician. Okay. So this is something that is very important 
and I've seen a lot of work done uh, where great models have been produced and basically they've never been used. It turns into shelfware. And that happens when this last step is not done, when you can't give this information to the user at the right time. This is something that I don't really know how to do, that I'm not expert in at all. Uh, and uh, that is why there is this whole separate discipline of these BI developers that uh, know how to do this kind of work, know how to present the data, and not just in in a in a nice and uh, appealing way, but uh, more importantly, in a timely way. I see. Now, you as a data scientist created the model, but do you, and I understand that you don't do the presentation side, maybe a different person on the team, but do you actually create the service or is that a different team too? That is a different team too. Okay. Uh, so the service meaning that uh, the automatic data polls, those are usually done by the people at the hospital. Again, they have to interact directly with the hospital's database. Ah. Uh, even in a uh, production environment, they uh, it is very difficult for uh, any one of us to work on directly on that side. We can do the work, but not while we are looking at the database, then we need to hand it over to them. Usually, this work is done uh, with the... Uh, is done by the uh, hospital's uh, ETL engineers. I see. Uh, and how long was the span of this project from your start of it to the end, roughly? The official kickoff was in January, um, early to mid-January. I am still working on it, and I will be working in the final readout for the my part, which includes the model and uh, will include a preliminary uh, data visualization component, but I would say very preliminary, is will be completed in uh, a few weeks, maybe two weeks or so. The Then the next stage of the project is actually quite interesting, and, and the hospital... Um, and I was also involved with this, is uh, writing a grant to get funding so that they can then test the model in uh, the hospital setting over a long period of time to see how, uh, what kind of reduction in C. diff infections uh, occurs. Obviously, we're hoping for a reduction in, in C. diff infections, and uh, that is that would be the next step. So that is an operationalizing step. I will be involved with that um, a little bit. Obviously, uh, model creation is not that important, but they, I will need to advise them on uh, how to interpret the values that they are seeing, the predictions they are seeing, and also on how to write up some of the statistics for their reports. Okay. When you got into this project and you started uh, meeting with the subject matter experts, you got a lot of information up front trying to become a domain expert. Uh, but then at the end of the project, you actually came up with conclusions. Were there surprises? There were a few surprises. And again, these are these influencers that uh, we find. Uh, there were a few um, one of the surprises, in retrospect, it's not that much of a surprise because, uh, well, most people would figure if there's a lot of C. diff going around, then it's a problem. Actually, the hospital was not did not think in that way. They were thinking, well, antibiotic use, acid suppressants, and uh, surgeries of certain types because those were known predictors or known influencers. They don't use those word predictors or influencers. They use uh, their medical jargon. Um, but I found that actually just hospital-wide use of antibiotics, hospital-wide uh, C. diff infections, 
that those are uh, quite important. So effectively, that that means is that a hospital that gets C. diff patients, for instance, if a transfer patient has C. diff and some of the bigger um, hospitals, teaching hospitals, get a lot of such patients. That puts basically everyone at risk in the hospital. Mm. It's sort of obvious when you say it after the fact, but this wasn't something that was uh, uh, considered uh, beforehand. So that was one of the things that we found. I'm trying to think of the others that were important. Uh, yes, a lot of uh, immune suppressants. Those were, um, we did not, uh, those weren't taken that seriously. We assumed that that had to do with the person being immune compromised. Um, but it seems that even a person that's not immune compromised in general, if they take a medication which has as a side effect immune suppression, then that will, uh, then that actually uh, leads to C. diff. And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, but maybe even fortuitously, uh, a study just came out uh, that uh, explains this. So although I'm seeing this as an effect without a deep understanding of the mechanisms that underlie this effect, but I can see the uh, from a high level, I can see which predictors are are doing this when I are are leading to the prediction, and I see that immune suppressants are uh, immune suppressing medications uh, lead to C diff, or or I can't even say that they lead to C diff. That's a big issue in in predictive analytics. All I can say is that they're correlated with C diff, right. but it turns out that there is now a study that actually is looking into them mechanism and proposes that these lead to C. diff. And so that's a big difference because previously it was thought that it was intrinsic to the patient who was immune suppressed to begin with. And now it actually seems that uh, that some even topical administration of some immune suppressants can lead to uh, this kind of a problem, to, can lead to this C. diff infection. So that was, uh, I guess, something that uh, we were scratching our heads about to begin with, not even taking it so seriously until the study came out and said, well, you know, we're the machine was probably right, and uh, we just weren't taking it seriously. Ah, now, I know, I hear this a lot, <clears throat> where you might come back and give an answer or a prediction model, and sometimes the experts actually doubt your model. Was that the case here, or were they more? Oh, receptive? often. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was often. Uh, uh, they are were very receptive and uh, very willing uh, to work and uh, thought through every nuance that they could. These were very dedicated people. Uh, yet they would often say it doesn't make sense according to what we know and what we've seen and and the medical literature. Uh, this is how it is, and often these. It didn't make sense. Sometimes, though, it did make sense what they said. And there is, um, next to data preparation and, and just moving data around, the next most time-draining exercise in predictive analytics can be what I call the proxy hunt. And we didn't get into that earlier when I was speaking, but there is a part in when you do classifications or regressions, any kind of supervised learning, where you use information that is actually not quite legit. Huh. And then, and it's not legit from the point of perspective that when it comes time to actually applying that model, you won't have that data available to you, or at least not in that form. This leads to models that test wonderfully well, but cannot be used in the real world. And those are, that's the phenomenon is called target leakage, mm -hmm. and uh, it is also called the attributes that are called proxies, because they stand in for that target outcome that you want to predict but they are actually not legitimate um, values. And I had a few of those, these proxies, 
And uh, fortunately, some of those proxies were uh, absolutely nonsensical. And so because of that, nonsensical from a medical point of view. And so that's how I was, that was one of the clues that I had that these were actually proxies. Huh. So is there, when you're predicting uh, your models, or I should say creating your models, are there some indicators that tell you that other than the, the human nonsensical side of that? Is there, is there anything yes, the common, the, the uh, easiest way of identifying these so-called proxies is if you do a correlation between all your attributes and your target outcome. And if you find a correlation that's really, really high, then it's most likely a proxy. Because, well, if it's really high, then uh, what that means is either you don't have a need to do any work as a data scientist because, well, you just have to take that uh, that attribute and say, okay, here's your your uh, your predictor and don't have to do any more work. Or you have to admit to yourself, well, there is uh, a reason why there is this high correlation and it is not because I'm lucky. It's almost always because there this information, although uh, you thought it was legitimate use, actually this information was not should not have been used as a predictor. That means somehow there was information that uh, had a foreknowledge of the fact that a person was going to get C. diff. And this foreknowledge can occur often in a database because we always look into the database and see only past data. Ah. We, unless the data are well time stamped and occur well before the event that we wish to predict, we're going to get into trouble and we're actually going to get some information that uh, uh, occurred after the event occurred. And some of this can be insidious. One of my issues was I had to, obviously, in order to avoid such proxies, I had to stop taking any lab tests after a person got a positive with C. diff. And in fact, I was saying, okay, I'll be even more generous than that. I'll stop taking any lab tests or using any lab tests in my model two days before the person got C. diff. So, and so for all the predictors and all the information that goes into my model, this data, two days before the person got C. diff, any, in that period, and any time after the person got C. diff, I cannot take any of that information because then I've basically, I'm um, just uh, telling the computer to distinguish between people who have C. diff and who don't have C. diff. And that is a whole lot easier than distinguishing between people who are going to get C. diff yeah. and who are not going to get C. diff. So that's no longer a prediction. It's a diagnosis. And there are, besides that, there are way better diagnostic tests. I could never compete with those. Okay, I introduced a proxy just now in my situation. What was the proxy? Well, if you don't get C. diff, I still take your lab tests. So people that get a lot of lab tests, the machine can figure that out and say, okay, they're not going to get C. diff because they have a whole lot more lab tests. Well, that makes absolutely no sense. Right. But to the machine, it makes perfect sense. I the machine see. just found a shortcut and went right to it. Basically, every lab test had a little negative component to it. Negative meaning less likely to get C. diff. Every time you got a lab test, you were somewhat less likely to get C. diff. Why? Because the people who didn't get C. diff, I was still counting their labs for prolonged periods of time, whereas I stopped taking any information from anyone who got C. diff. I see. Fascinating. So it's a really, that's a, a, a so that. These are the kinds of things that lead to target leakage. They can You think that it's a simple thing when you first hear about the phenomenon of proxies and target leakage, but they can be very insidious. They can be very difficult to figure out. And so I had to make a more primitive model, and I had to say, hey, after the first two days, I don't take lab tests from anyone. Ah. 
Then the physicians come back to me and say, well, but the problem with C. diff is, is that these people are in the uh, hospital for longer periods of time. And I, then I said, okay, then I can do the same thing, can make a whole new model with all of the work where I take, instead of the first two days of the hospital stay, I take the first four days of the hospital stay and predict C. diff starting after the sixth day. Ah. And then I can repeat that again, you know, go by two-day increments as to how far out you want to go. But the whole process, all the data pulls and all the uh, have to be such that I take only the data up to a certain point in time and predict only from people that do not have C. diff at that point in time whether they will get C. diff uh, two days, two or more days later. So that is uh, how that exercise has to progress. So there is quite it's quite possible that they will ask me to create more models. Basically, it's the same recipe, but uh, again with a slightly different data pulls. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so Ernst, I know you've been doing this a long time, uh, but every project we learn something from it. Is there anything specific that it, even though I know that you're still doing the tail end of this project is there anything you would do different or even as a team you guys have learned to do different from this experience i would say that this has been one of the more successful projects so far and i would say that one of the reasons for that is the fact that we work on site a lot we interact on site with the people. So that is, uh, that means I wouldn't do this differently, but that reinforced what I said earlier about the close contact. Absolutely. What I would do differently otherwise, I guess I would uh, work even more closely with the data engineers and get them to uh, set up uh, the their data pulls in a more generic way, which has more uh, more of the parameters are abstracted out because now I have everything geared for the first two days and with the physicians coming back to me saying that they want to have be able to predict uh, based on more than the first two days of laboratory tests. Um, I'm in a, in a position where I need to go back to the engineers and say, well, what can you do about it? And they say, well, sure, we can do new polls, but that will take on the order of weeks, and I have to complete this project in a, in a much shorter time than they can even pull the data. So I guess I would ask for uh, the... I would try to be on top of uh, the people who are pulling the data and to do it in a way that's even more reusable and than, uh, than we had. So although I'm quite happy with uh, the their uh, development skills and the fact that they were able to make these uh, data pools reusable, I would want even more of that because then that would have that would actually allow me to create at least an addition one additional model to go further into a, a patient's hospital stay to predict even further into the future or use more lab data uh, so that a patient who has not contracted C diff uh, in their first six days that I can actually use their first four days of lab and so and so on. I understand. Ernst, I always like to ask, uh, with all the interesting stuff that you're doing in this project and in Microsoft, is there anything on the horizon next year, next three years, that really interests you that uh, you're looking forward to getting involved with? Yes, there is. Um, IoT, it's one of these big words. I guess everything now is, is IoT, Internet of Things. But what that means for me in uh, healthcare is that there that all the sensors that are hooked up to all the patients that those machines that are the back end of those sensors they are all talking to each other now 
-hmm. And siphoning off information from that network of data will lead to very new types of modeling. And I am looking into that. So, for instance, combining these electronic medical records data that I have, that I'm using now in the CDIF project, I could be able to take real-time data from patients, typically in an ICU, where there is a lot of real-time data based because of all the sensors that are hooked up to the patients, and combine those two to create uh, predictions that might warn a physician that in the next one or two hours, something is going to happen to the patient. Mm, very interesting stuff. The hospital that you're working with, have you had any of those discussions? Is that something that might be in the near future? I'm in discussions with another hospital, with actually two other hospitals uh, for this project. The hospital that I'm working on, the C. diff, they, um, as everyone, they are interested in this technology, but they, uh, that is not on their uh, priority list. Ah. But it is on uh, the priority list of two other hospitals, uh, and I'm already in contact with them. That's great stuff. Uh, Ernst, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience from some of the topics we talked about before we wrap this show up? Well, I enjoyed this discussion. Thank you very much. All right. Well, Ernst, we certainly appreciated having you. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thanks, too. Hey, thanks for joining us on AI Exposed. Once again, I'm your host, Justin Scott, and I'd love your feedback on this show. Just hit me up on Twitter at AI Exposed or send me an email at AI Exposed at Outlook.com. Take care.